So just like the previous lectures, if you have questions, please type them into the chat and the speaker will periodically uh, stop in order to answer them or I will prompt him. Um, but without further ado, here is Amahe Hanani speaking about magnetic quivers and phase diagrams. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, it's uh, nice to be in Bengaluru again. <laughs> I, I was uh, there a few years ago. It, well, it's a beautiful uh, location and I really wish to be back there again. So uh, now we compromise by doing it online. Um, so um, I, I'm going to devote this set of lectures to um, various concepts on uh, Coulomb branches of uh, three-dimensional uh, uh, gauge theories with n equal four supersymmetry. Um, there's a collection of technical details that I would like to go over. Um, and we will begin with a relatively uh, simple uh, application, and then we will uh, gradually develop uh, more and more tools. Um, so you, you see the uh, the concept. Uh, I'd like uh, the, my goal is that by the end of these lectures, we will understand those concepts: the monopole formula, the magnetic quiver, and the phase diagram. Okay. Um, so um, we will review uh, the current understanding that we have of uh, modular spaces with eight supercharges. Uh, those are Higgs branches in three, four, five, and six dimensions. And I will hope to be able to go over some phenomena which arise at the strong decoupled theories. And they are also, um, I, I think the, the, the biggest advancement was the fact that we understood how to deal with Coulomb branches in three dimensions. And this led to the whole uh, conceptual progress that we have in higher dimensions. Uh, I mean, so, quick request, can you make it full screen? Oh, thank you. Now it's better, right? Okay, so um, let's uh, proceed. So uh, this, um, this graph that we see over here uh, is a rough depiction of uh, the structure of symplectic singularities. So uh, for many years, we know how to construct uh, symplectic singularities as hyperkähler quotients. Maybe the name is new, but they used to be called um, hyperkähler cones or hyperkähler singularities. I'm going to use uh, the name the symplectic singularities, singularities, but I mean the same uh, thing. Um, uh, the phenomenon of 3D mirror symmetry happens when uh, you have uh, one singularity that has two types of construction, once as a Higgs branch of some theory and once as a Coulomb branch of a different theory. Um, so this has been studied quite intensively. Uh, things which were not studied so much until let's say uh, seven years ago, the Coulomb branches in three dimensions. Um, and that's where the new physics shows up. Right? So, so if I have a symplectic singularity which has a construction as a Coulomb branch of some uh, theory and not as a hyperkähler quotient, then it's something that we did not have access to in the uh, previous uh, studies. And that's where we would expect to find many nice and exciting physical phenomena. Now, there are many other singularities which have no construction, not as a hyperkähler quotient and not as a Coulomb branch. Uh, we just don't have access to them. Uh, so that there should be some, uh, other ways of constructing, um, but we just don't know them. So um, there's certainly room 
for improvement. Any questions about this point? Okay, so um, how, how do we characterize uh, symplectic singularities? We pick uh, some uh, uh, physical quantities and we uh, just use them to characterize the symplectic singularity. So the first thing that you do is to specify the dimension of uh, this um, modular space. That's a single integer number, uh, which uh, is the first characterization. Then the next thing that people do is to specify the uh, global symmetry. Um, uh, that's one group uh, or a product which acts on the uh, modular space. And, and uh, again, in this case, there have been many works which uh, uh, dealt with the uh, evaluation of this global symmetry. Also, uh, sometimes in uh, physical systems, uh, there is a phenomenon of uh, symmetry enhancement, and this was also studied quite uh, intensively. Now, here's a new point that was uh, studied much less than the first two, uh, and this is the phase diagram. So, by phase diagram, we, we will uh, actually go quite in detail about this because that's one of the points that I would like to uh, introduce and to um, um, promote it as a tool for understanding uh, symplectic singularity. So a phase is uh, uh, by definition a set uh, of vacua where if I compute the spectrum of the corresponding vacuum, the number of massive states uh, stays fixed, whereas the massive states may change. Um, and um, uh, and then uh, you could have a singularity with different phases, so different sets of massive states. And um, uh, there, there could be transitions from one phase to another. Uh, and so those are depicted by a Hasse diagram. So uh, we will go over this. Uh, next thing what we we can do to characterize the symplectic singularity is to use the information of the global symmetry and to extract the representation content of the chiral ring or the ring of holomorphic functions on this space. Uh, the corresponding uh, uh, functions called the Hegel series. So we will go over a few cases like that. And uh, once we know the representation content, we can collect them into generating functions which generate the highest weights. So that's a, a simpler function than the Hilbert says in many cases. And, and we can see that there are some um, generic classes where you could uh, write very nice formulas. Uh, and finally, the, uh, the most complicated thing to compute is to actually derive the chiral ring uh, you need to identify the generators, uh, the way they transform, and the relations that they satisfy. Many times this uh, requires quite a lot of work. And um, uh, in many modular spaces, it is left as a, a project to do rather than a, a, a done project. Any Sorry, questions? We had a question about the last uh, slide. Yes, the, the one before. Yes. What's the uh, question? It, it was um, just a simple comment. Uh, shouldn't the two smaller circles be contained in the larger one? Uh, you, you mean uh, this part here? Yeah, yeah. So there, there are always uh, hyperkähler quotients which are not simple to um, So uh, for example, uh, you, you could have a simple uh, Higgs branch, classical, where uh, the modular space will be a union of two symplectic singularities. Now, a union of symplectic singularities is not a symplectic singularity. So th there are uh, cases where uh, it's not. Uh, um, 
it's harder to construct examples uh, on this part. Um, and that's why I wrote it uh, like that. Uh, we, we could have all options. Okay, thanks. Okay. So, um, if, if you take um, SU2 with uh, two flavors, um, the Higgs punch is a union of two cones, and the Coulomb branch is, uh, uh, has, has two bases. So, again, not a synthetic similar. More questions? I don't see any. Okay, so uh, that's that's my goal here. Uh, my goal is that I have each of these concepts uh, in this list we will go over and, and that we will begin uh, one by one, make sure that we know how to compute each case and um, be able to at least discuss the, uh, this uh, language um, and, and apply it to a, a collection of modular spaces. So let's, let's start very simply the dimension. So I assume that uh, many people in the audience know this discussion, but let's just do it uh, and see if there are questions about it. So the dimension, uh, dimension of the Higgs branch uh, divides into two main cases, uh, whether, uh, depending on the question, whether there is complete Higgsing of the gauge group or not. And if there is complete Higgsing, the dimension of the Higgs punch is just number of hypers minus number of vectors. Uh, and uh, we will see many cases where this uh, computation can be done. Uh, more uh, complicated is the case where there's no complete Higgsing and there are plenty of examples where this happens. And here we just apply the formulation of the Higgs mechanism as uh, going back to the work of uh, Kibble in uh, 67, uh, just after the, uh, the phenomenon of the Higgs mechanism was uh, discovered. So, um, so let's go over the details here. Uh, this would be good to establish the notation. So, um, if I have a theory with a gauge group G and matter uh, R, this representation R uh, can be um, reducible, can be a collection of uh, several irreducible representations and, uh, as, as general as can be. And, uh, and now suppose that the gauge group is broken to a subgroup H, then what we need to do is to decompose the representation R into irreducible representations of the, uh, the, the subgroup H. The AI now will be the multiplicities of each irreducible representation. I here uh, is a sum over all possible irreducible representations. So most of those numbers A are zero, okay? Uh, similarly, I could uh, also this, uh, decompose that joint representation of the group G into that joint of H as this is a subgroup. And then extra representation which have different multiplicities denoted by D, okay? I will also use the notation that uh, R0 is the trivial representation, okay? Now, uh, after such decomposition, the next thing we do is to um, um, have the remaining uh, gauge group, so it's H, and now it couples to uh, new matter fields in representation R prime of H. And uh, we, we just do the Higgs mechanism, right? So the, uh, the, the sum of the matter fields are absorbed by the uh, vector fields and they become massive. So I need to subtract them. And uh, I'm left with um, the, this multiplicity of representations of uh, H, okay? But now I have a very important condition. Uh, these are multiplicities of representation, so they must be all non-negative. And furthermore, if I look at the trivial representation, this gives me the dimension of the Higgs function. Remember, we started with this question. 
what is the dimension of the Higgs punch in the case of uh, non-complete fixing, and uh, we have to go through this uh, formulation. Any questions about this? So I, was about to type, I was about to type a question, but uh, when you say dimension, you mean complex, quaternionic, um, what's it's the context? Always, thank you, thank you. So it's always going to be quaternionic dimension. I, I will not use a complex dimension. Um, more questions? So, so, so here the, the hypermultiplets transform in representation R plus R bar, or I mean, is that what you mean? Uh, I mean, one needs to interpret these yeah, formulas so, a little carefully. Uh, right, so, so uh, indeed uh, um, we are being a, a, a little sloppy about the, uh, the counting but uh, when you say, uh, so, so if, if you want really to work with a, a hypermatic plate, uh, then uh, you want to divide into the cases where the representation is complex, real or pseudo real. Um, and, and here what I, just, uh, what I took is just a representative of uh, this thing. It, it, it turns out that if you do it for each case, then uh, you could summarize it by uh, this, uh, this formula. So when I tell you that uh, I have a hypermultiplet in representation R, then I should think about it as a, a, a pair of chiral multiplets, uh, one in representation R and the other in representation R bar. And so when I say H couples to uh, this, uh, this matter, and, and number of hypers is A minus B times this representation, then I need to count it in this way. Okay. We will do a simple example and, you know, uh, we, we can try and uh, go over this. More questions. Okay, um, so uh, let's proceed. The dimension of the Coulomb branch is just going to be the rank of the, um, uh, the gate group that we start with. So if we have a quiver, uh, it's going to be the sum of gauge uh, of nodes. If the, each node is a unitary gauge group, then we'll just have to sum over the labels. And if uh, there are no, um, uh, no flavor modes. We will also remember that there's an overall U1 which uh, acts trivially on the matter fields, and so we'll have to subtract one from the gauge. Um, any questions about this? Okay, uh, now sorry, there, there, there is a question to explain more about singularities. Uh, what's the question? Uh, can you explain more about singularities? Uh, let me see if I can find the participant and unmute him. Yeah, if, if you could elaborate on what you mean by explaining more about Yeah, sorry, I just have to unmute him. I've asked him to unmute himself. but he does not seem to be doing it. Uh, so he has two. Okay. Um, Maybe you should go on and you can ask yeah. a question later. Okay. Yeah, okay. I agree. Okay, thank you. So, um, um, yeah, so let, let's discuss the global symmetry. And here uh, there is some uh, input from um, uh, the, uh, the theory of uh, functions on, on uh, symplectic singularity. So we, we start with a, a moduli space, either a Higgs branch or a Coulomb branch, which has an R symmetry that acts on this moduli space, it rotates the complex structures. So the approach that we are taking is to pick one of those complex structures and use this to define the notion of a holomorphic function. Uh, there is a corresponding U1, the Cartan sub 
group of SC2R, which uh, gives a weight to this uh, holomorphic function. And it is in the normalization such that uh, the weight N uh, is going to be the highest weight of the representation that has spin on N over two under SC2R. Right, so that, that's an important thing to uh, keep in mind. Uh, and, and now we could focus on those uh, functions of weight two. Um, uh, since this is a symplectic singularity, we also have a symplectic form. So we can just pair two functions into this uh, form and get a third function. Uh, but because of uh, the structure, uh, it turns out that I take two functions of weight two and I uh, get another function of weight two. And so uh, the functions of weight two form a closed uh, algebra and, and, and uh, they, they now give me a, a Lie algebra. And so uh, we will have that the, um, uh, the global symmetry is actually uh, encoded in the set of functions of weight two. Um, and so the adjoint, uh, so weight two corresponds to spin one under SU2R. And so um, weight two is going to be the um, uh, adjoint representation of the global symmetry. So, so in order to identify the global symmetry, symmetry, what I need to do is to figure out all the uh, functions on the modular space which have weight two. Right, so I, I'll, I'll have to think of various ways of doing that. Once I figure this out, I have an expression for the global symmetry. Any questions about this point? So I first saw it in a paper by Kostant and Brilinski from uh, around the uh, when was that? early 90s, I believe. Uh, but the way it was written there, uh, it looked like uh, it's a known thing. They didn't spend too much time on the explanation. They just uh, set it out. So I, I assume that this is already known uh, back then. Okay, so, so um, now let's do a connection with the physics, right? So, so let's say I have a Higgs branch, then uh, you know, you could write down the Lagrangian and the global symmetry is extracted from uh, the, the, uh, the Lagrangian. And so if I have a quiver that have flavor nodes, uh, a collection of flavor nodes of rank and I, then we will say that global symmetry is a product, U and I, and I need to remember that uh, there is an overall U1, which uh, acts uh, trivially, we mentioned it before, and, and as a result, uh, this is the global symmetry. And that's also the global symmetry I should be able to find if I will count all of the weight to functions as before. So uh, if I have quarks in my um, hypermultiplets, then uh, they would have uh, weight one. So now that weight, weight two, I, I need to have bilinears in those quarks. And so what we need to do is to figure out all possible uh, mesons I can construct from quarks and they necessarily will transform in the joint representation of the global symmetry. Okay, any questions about this point? Okay, let's proceed. Uh, now uh, we will do the, the Coulomb branch. Uh, here again, I, I'm after the same thing, I look for all functions of weight two. Uh, and uh, there, is, uh, there seems to be a, a balance condition which works in a large class of quivers, uh, but there are certainly exceptions to that. Uh, but let's go over this uh, criterion. It's a simple criterion, so it's good to know it in case you haven't seen this before. Uh, so the condition goes like that. First of all, I define the notion of balance. So it's the sum of node runs which are connected to the node I'm checking. Uh, I subtract 
twice it's uh, the rank of this node. And this is called the balance of the node. If the balance is zero, I call it a balance node. Uh, now, uh, the, the way to identify uh, the global symmetry would be to uh, take the subset, given a quiver, I take the subset of balance node, they form a Dinkin diagram. And this is the Dinkin diagram for the non equivalent part of the global symmetry. Okay, so that's a very simple combinatorial criterion to extract global symmetry from Coulomb branches. And it may have been covered in other lectures or not, I, I'm not sure. Uh, now, if it turns out that there are uh, other nodes which are not balanced, each one of them will contribute an additional U1. Uh, I have to remove a U1. Uh, we said it, this is the third time we mentioned this. There is an overall U1 that I need to remove. And so the global symmetry is U1 to the N minus one together with the non-abelian part, which is computed by the Dinkin diagram. Uh, however, there are some cases where this criterion uh, is only producing a subset or a subgroup of the uh, global symmetry. And, uh, and then I will just have to explicitly evaluate uh, to look for all of the functions of weight two, right? So, um, here is, uh, so I gave two exercises here. Uh, so consider those two quivers, okay? And the challenge I would give is to find the global symmetry. First of all, to apply the balance condition that we said before. And uh, second, to uh, use your favorite method to find the all functions of way two, and to show that the uh, global symmetry is bigger than what you would compute from the balance condition. Okay. Any questions about this, uh, this problem or the criterion for global symmetry? Yes, so there are two questions. Uh, Jacques, do you want to ask yours first? Oh, yeah. Um, in the previous uh, um, uh, uh, distinction between ba balanced and unbalanced, I assume you mean that the, you're considering uh, good quivers in the sense of... Um, yes, I suppose, yes. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and then... Right. Otherwise, you need to distinct to distinguish overbalanced from underbalanced. Yeah, it's no longer a symmetric singularity. And then, uh, right. Right. Exactly. Well, that that that's actually an answer to Ashwin's previous question. Oh, I see. Okay. The, the, the theories which are no longer symplectic singularities. <laughs> uh, no. So, do you want to distinguish ones that have conical C star action, ones that don't? Uh, yeah, well, yeah, well so if they're good quivers, then then I think they're all conic. Yes, yes. I, I'm going to use this assumption that the, the singularities are conical, otherwise they are not singularities. And uh, I, I mean, I, I'm not, uh, I, I, on the contrary, the, the, those guys which are not conical are very interesting and they are very important to study except that the techniques I'm going to use will not be useful for those. Uh, so we will have to develop new techniques for studying those. Uh, and therefore I restrict to those cases where the singularity is conical. Uh, okay. So then there's a second so, question from Matt. Yes. Which is, uh, I'll, un I'll ask him to unmute himself, but uh, yes, bigger means the rank increases. Um, I think that was about the other slide. What did I write? Bigger? Ah, bigger. Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, that the, um, yeah, yeah. So that the, uh, uh, so, so you have a, a, a global symmetry from balance uh, that you compute from balance, right? So this criterion, the balance linking diagram. And the global symmetry is, the actual global symmetry is a, a group. So, so the balance, symmetry is a subgroup of this 
through symmetry. At, at a minimum, the, the dimension is bigger. Sometimes the rank is, is also bigger. Yes, sometimes the rank is bigger, yes. <laughs> Jacques knows those examples. <laughs> Very well, alas. I <laughs> see. So, for Jacques, this is a boring exercise. <laughs> not, but this will be very nice. Huh? Not, what, not what? boring at all. Um. I see, okay. So, so, so uh, you know, those are very nice, uh, uh, you know, you would think th those are just uh, uh, ordinary quibbles, right? They, are, they look uh, innocent. Uh, um, both of them have a class S description and uh, uh, just a collection of numbers, right? And they look like any other quibble, right? But uh, for uh, whatever reason, they don't satisfy this uh, uh, this uh, balance uh, global symmetry description. Okay. Great. Thank you. Thank you. So we proceed. Uh, I, I should say that. Uh, so I mentioned here the reference to the, the, the work uh, of uh, Kirsty. Um, uh, there, there's a, actually a large classes of such. Examples where you could uh, construct uh, quivers which are ordinary looking, but nevertheless, uh, the global symmetry is uh, bigger than the expected uh, symmetry you compute from balance. Okay, uh, so uh, you remember uh, in the list, uh, we did the dimension, we did now the global symmetry. The next point to cover is the uh, a phase diagram, and we are going to spend some time on these concepts because I believe that uh, many of these concepts are, are, are new. So let's just go slowly over this thing. Uh, it, do, do you hear the noise uh, from outside? Shall I close the door? It's not too bad. It, the, we can hear a little bit, but it's it's not a big problem. Okay. Okay, so uh, now um, um, yeah, so what, what is the concept of a Hasse diagram or uh, that's the mathematical name and a phase diagram is the physical name. So we, we are going to focus on the massless fields that I can compute around each vacuum. Right, so I, I have a moduli space, I pick a point. This defines a vacuum of uh, quantum field theory. And so I can compute the spectrum of states around this vacuum. And there will be massive states and massless states. And I'm going to have some um, form of an equivalence condition. I will say uh, um, a phase is characterized only by the set of massless states. If two vacua have a different set of massive states, but the same set of massless states, I will uh, call them uh, the same uh, phase. Um, so uh, as I move along a phase, the set of massless states is fixed but the set of massive states can vary. There are BPS formulas, in case those are uh, massive states which are BPS, and uh, the, the formulas will tell you how those masses change. But the thing which is important for us is that the set of massless states are fixed. Now in the uh, uh, mathematical uh, language, a phase, what we call a phase is a symplectic leaf. Right, so we have this parallel, symplectic leaf is a phase of the physical system. Now, um, one point here to, to, to emphasize is that we are dealing with uh, moduli spaces that always have some set of massless states. So we, we are not going to talk about phases of uh, matter like uh, confinement phase or Higgs phase. Uh, we always we are going to have some, some form of 
massless states because we have moduli spaces of aqua. Uh, however, it is very important to make a distinction between different phases where massless states are different, right? So um, I hope this point is, is uh, clear. Let's proceed. Um, so those things I said before, but let's just emphasize the third point. So as I move along the moduli space, masses change. And at some critical points, some states become massless. Then what we would say is that uh, in, uh, the previous set of massless states now is accompanied by few more. So the uh, set is bigger and the phase is different. So the phase now is, uh, contains more massless states. Uh, in the Hasse diagram, uh, I will have now two points, two symplectic leaves, and there is a relation between them. Uh, I need to tune some moduli in order to move from one phase to another. Okay, any questions about this point? Okay, so what, uh, given such a structure, uh, there are a few natural questions we can ask. So uh, suppose that I move from phase A to phase B that has more massless fields. So I want to give names to uh, such phases. Uh, maybe specify the number of massless states, uh, use a partition to name it, uh, something to characterize one phase from another. Uh, the second point is that I, I want to ask how many moduli do I need to tune in order to get from phase A to phase B? Uh, is it just one hypermultiplet that I need to tune or maybe a few more that I need to tune? Uh, and I want to ask what kind of geometry do these moduli that I tune, uh, what, what is the geometry that they form? And so those are transition moduli. Right, because they help me move from phase A to phase B. Right, so what kind of transition moduli can I have? Any questions? Uh, I have a quick question. So before we talk about a Hase diagram and so on, uh, we, are, we seem to be making an assumption, right? We are making an assumption that that's the right language to use. In other words, if there is some stratification of the full moduli space, um, yes. There is actually some partial order because that's the situation in which Hasset diagrams are useful. Uh, so, is that an assumption, or can we show that that's true? Oh, uh, that's an excellent uh, question. Certainly, for me, it's an assumption um, because uh, you, you know I I, um, I looked at the examples. In all examples, uh, the, the, the there was a finite number of leaves. And that's mm -hmm. already a, an interesting question. It could be infinite. So in all cases that I've seen, the, there's a finite number. And uh, in all of those cases, the, uh, the transitions from one leaf to another, the, the transfer slice, uh, were uh, simple uh, singularities of the type that we already know from uh, before. Um, but uh, you're right. Uh, so uh, if you've looked at the uh, uh, fine Grassmannian for uh, in, in a fine uh, algebra, uh, such questions would arise, and, uh, and uh, I'm not aware of a good answer over there. So we are certainly restricting ourselves to the subset, but I wouldn't know how to characterize it precisely. So I think it's an open question. Uh, you know, what, what, um, uh, what is the set for which what we are saying over here uh, uh, fits uh, nicely? Um, so we will have to think of some mathematical way of formulating it. Okay. Right, so you see, uh, you know, what, what types of uh, symplectic singularities do we uh, deal with when we are, are uh, working with gauge theory. There is the set of 
closures of nilpotent orbits. There is the uh, slot of these slices which intersect with them. So, so that's one bigger, much bigger set of um, modular spaces. There are slices in the fine Grassmannian uh, of uh, algebras of finite type. And then there are slices of algebras with a fine type. And um, you, you have, uh, uh, let me see if I uh, miss some uh, families. So within these families, uh, uh, modulo this uh, beast, which is the affine Gassmannian for affine algebras, uh, the others are well behaved pretty much. And so within these families, uh, the, I can say that there is a finite number, there is a stratification, there is a finite number of leads, there are slices, they, they are all under control. And there are, so for example, are you familiar with the work of um, uh, Weeks, uh, Jacobi, Kamnitzer, Webster on, um, on the affine Gassmannian, the finite type? I may have seen, but familiar would be too strong a word. So I see. I okay, so they would they would have partial answers to this, right? So they study the different slices and they give you theorems of the behavior of the such slices. Um, yeah. So uh, actually, so I'll just say one more thing. So my question was more along the lines of so uh, I mean there are spaces that have like say some natural stratification. But this Hase diagram imposes several strong conditions. One condition, for example, is that the closure of some stratum is the union of some smaller strata. So that is already something, I don't think it's automatic. I think we have to sh sort of show that that's true for some generic 3D n equal to 4 theory or something like that. That's, that's the kind of thing I was... Uh, I see, and I'm certainly assuming uh, this, uh, and not, uh, not, uh, I'm not testing it. Right? That's okay. a good point. Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, so I, I um, in fact, I'm not aware of a case where uh, a closure is not the union of the lower leads. Uh, so that's that's a good question. Thanks. Um, Okay, that a perfect question. So are we uh, together with the students also? Questions from the students? Okay, I'm, I'm going to proceed. Uh, so um, the transition moduli, uh, what I'm going to argue now is that they are necessarily conical. Why is that? It's because the way we formulated it, we say that uh, um, we don't mind what is the mass. We just care whether it's massive or not. So if I have a massive uh, state and I do rescaling, then if it was massive before, it stays massive. And if it was massless before, it remains massless. And as, as a result, we get a conical structure. And so we would say that uh, at the origin, at the place where the um, states become massless, uh, um, that's where we transition to the new uh, phase. Right? So the transition moduli are necessarily conical. And, uh, and as a result, there is this interesting question, uh, what kind of transition moduli? So let's, let's consider a very simple example. Now, uh, Jacques, that's the uh, only case where I'm now uh, counting real dimensions. It's a very simple example of a free scalar field uh, of uh, mass uh, M. And I'm just asking what are the phases of this uh, scalar field? There are two phases. The one phase is where the mass is non-zero. It's a one dimensional phase. There are zero massless states. And there is a second phase where the mass is zero. It's a zero dimensional phase, but right? there's only one point. Uh, and it has one uh, massless state. Uh, the, the mass is a parameter of R plus. 
and therefore we say that the transition modulus M is uh, parameterizing the cone R plus, which is one dimensional, okay? So the reason I chose this example is just to demonstrate that the notion of uh, partial order exists not only for symplectic singularities, it is there for any uh, theory, whether supersymmetric or not. Uh, the great advantage that we have when we deal with symplectic singularities is that we can use the geometry and the, the structure of uh, uh, these uh, spaces in order to extract uh, much more information than we would be able to do in the non supersymmetric case. Any questions about this example? Okay, so, um, so now we, we come to the concept of a minimal transition. So uh, given a phase, a minimal transition is a, um, a minimal set, is a choice of a minimal set of moduli that are tuned in order to move to a new phase, such that uh, not, nowhere in between, I will reach an intermediate point, right? And if I look at the minimal transition, the, the Hasse diagram, since it's a cone, it has its own Hasse diagram and uh, it contains only of two points. Uh, so uh, it's, uh, there are two phases. One is the origin where we have uh, extra massless states and, and the other is uh, anything else where uh, nothing special happens. I'm still in the previous phase. Okay, so this calls for a very important problem uh, to find all such uh, minimal cases. And this is a very difficult problem, both in physics and in mathematics. Uh, it was uh, partially solved in the work of uh, Kraft and Pochesi when they studied the uh, Hasse diagrams for uh, nilpotent cones. And uh, they showed that uh, minimal uh, transitions are of type uh, uh, ADE for uh, classical uh, algebras uh, together with a uh, uh, few more cases which are minimal orbits of uh, B and C um, algebras. Um, any questions about this point? Okay, so, uh, so now we are uh, coming to the construction of the Hasse diagram or the phase diagram. Uh, we will have a diagram with the, which has two objects. Nodes are going to uh, denote phases or symplectic leaves. Edges are going to denote the transition moduli or alternatively the transfer slices uh, between one leaf to another. And uh, we want to, given a symplectic singularity, a good way to characterize this symplectic singularity is by uh, computing its uh, phase diagram. So the next thing we want to do is to show how to compute this. Before we get to the technical details, are there any questions? Okay, I made this comment about supersymmetry. Uh, so just to em emphasize, every theory has this structure. So uh, Ashvin, uh, for your question, I'm now going to make a, a very big uh, uh, expectation on theories which are not supersymmetric, but they will also have this structure of Hasse diagrams. And that uh, uh, is, uh, we should contrast it with the, with the question because we, you are challenging the point whether this structure exists uh, for uh, different things. I'm not sure if you had in mind this notion of uh, going beyond uh, this amount of supersymmetry, but, um, uh, yeah, I mean, we should 
expect such a structure in many, many theories, not just this amount of supersymmetry. Uh, did I just uh, do two things? Uh, can I ask a quick question about what you meant by minimal transition? So, uh, if I understand right, you're looking at the geometry of uh, the slice to some orbit intersected with sort of the next biggest orbit in the partial order. That that's the kind of geometry. Yes. yes. Uh, so, and, and and what is the minimal transition? So, uh, so we, we could also state it in a, in a simpler way. We could say, consider all of the symplectic singularities, which have a Hasse diagram that contains two points connected by one line. Mm -hmm. That's the formulation of the problem. Can you find the set of all such singularities? Ah, okay. Right, such that each such singularity has two phases, or two leaves, uh, the, the origin and anything else, nothing in between. So I think uh, in mathematics, sometimes they are called uh, uh, isolated singularities. And, and I think my next slide is going to discuss this. Right. So this is so these are examples. Um, so uh, what we did here was to take the ADE. It's a well-known uh, class of quivers, the ADE quivers. But one very nice thing about them that all of them are a, a simple symplectic singularities. The Hasse diagram contains just two points connected by one line. Okay, so here are the Hasse diagrams. Uh, and and here, are, here is another Hasse diagram. Let's just go over each uh, quiver individually. So uh, these are the A type affine uh, Dinkin diagram. A result by Kronheimer shows that the Higgs punch of such a quiver is the Klein singularity of type A, Duval singularity, sometimes people call it, and uh, the corresponding Hasse diagram is over here. It's one dimensional, and there are two points, the origin and anything else. Okay. This diagram over here has a Higgs punch, which is a, the a Klein singularity of type D. And again, the Hasse diagram is depicted here. We're going to use the symbol capital D for such a Klein singularity. And then there are the three more over here, E6, 7, or 8. Again, by Kronheimer, the Higgs punch is a Klein singularity of type of the corresponding E. On the other hand, now we go beyond the work of Kronheimer, the Coulomb branch, really Coulomb branch of the first family is the minimal, the closure of the minimal nilpotent orbit of type A. And we denote it like that, lowercase a, the dimension is n. So for SLN plus one, the uh, minimal orbit is of dimension n. Uh, Coulomb branch here is of type D, and the Coulomb branch of each of those quivers is E uh, here. And uh, notice that we are uh, making a distinction between a client singularity with capital letters and a closure of a minimal orbit with lowercase. Now, to those things, we should also add the minimal orbits which are non simply lexed. Right, so those are also allowed uh, singularities and they would show up in um, various symplectic singularities. Uh, we will hopefully see such examples. Here I listed the dimensions of each of those singularities. So it's important to understand that minimal transitions 
uh, don't have to be of dimension one, as for the Klein case, they can be of very large dimension. They can be uh, as large as, uh, as the value of n, or uh, for E8, they can be 29. So quite large set of moduli, which has a smooth behavior uh, along the um, um, points. Any questions? Okay, so uh, we we moved over. Some, we went over a set, a simple set of uh, Higgs branches. Um, now uh, let's do uh, an example where the uh, symplectic leaves have. Um, some structure, uh, so three leaves instead of two, or uh, two slices. And so the example that I picked is the case of SU3 with the six levels. And what I want to do is to derive the um, phase diagram using two ways. And, and, and this is uh, um, one of the and novelties in, in the work. I, I believe this has not been uh, done in many other works. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, so uh, there were two ways. Uh, one is through the Higgs punch, where I work my way uh, from the origin upwards, or one is through the method of uh, quiver uh, subtractions, when where I start from the uh, top of the diagram and then work my way downwards. Okay, so let's start with the Higgs mechanism. Um, and now what we're going to do is to recall the method of uh, Kibble. And so Jacques now let's go over carefully and uh, check uh, whether uh, you're satisfied with the computation. So, uh, so we start with the origin. Right? The origin uh, is zero dimensional. Uh, that's the only point where SU3 is massless and it couples to uh, six flavors. So the next point is we turn on some of the moduli and we do it such that an SU2 uh, remains uh, massless. So we move to a new phase. And as Kibble instructs us to do, what we need to do is to uh, um, decompose the representations of SU3 into representations of SU2. So they are joint, the composers to the adjoint of SU2, two fundamentals and one uh, singlet. Whereas the uh, three dimensional representation decomposes to uh, the fundamental of SU2 plus a single, okay? And then recall what uh, we did, we, we just need to subtract. So there are six copies of the fundamental. So when I do the subtraction, I, I'm left with six times two minus two here. This gives me four copies of the fundamental. And uh, the singlets, I start with uh, six, I subtract one and left with five. Any questions about this computation? So let's give the interpretation. Uh, I'm left with an SU2 gauge group that couples to four fundamental hypers. So that gives me a, an effective theory, which is SU2 with four flavors. That's the massless theory at this uh, different phase. And in addition, I have five extra moduli. And in order to understand them, I notice that there is a singlet here. These singlets, as part of the composition of the adjoint, represents the U1 subgroup that commutes with the SU2 inside SU3. And so uh, there is a U1 group here, which is uh, gauged, but it also couples to six fundamentals. So six charged objects. So the effective theory is U1 with six charged objects. 
U1 with six flavors. So those five moduli actually parameterize the Higgs branch of U1 with six flavors. Okay, so let's go back to the Hasse diagram that we had before. We move from the point at the origin to the uh, point where SU2 is unbroken. Uh, this phase is, has dimension five quaternionic. And the moduli that I need to make a transition from one phase to another parameterize the cone of U1 with six level, namely the minimal nilpotent orbit of SL6. Any questions about this? Okay, so we, we figured out the bottom part of the Hasse diagram using the Higgs mechanism. Next, I'm left with uh, the theory of uh, SU2 with four flavors. So I can ask, how can I Higgs this theory? There's no um, subgroup. This is a basic uh, theory. Uh, SU2 with four flavors is one of those slices that are fundamental. Uh, minimal and so um, uh, the dimension of the model of the Higgs punch of SU2 with four flavors is five quaternionic and um, when I uh, tune those moduli to the origin I reach the phase where SU2 is unbroken at any other point SU2 is fully broken and now the model space is five plus the previous five ten dimensional so that's what is depicted in this part of the Hasse diagram. So the transfer slice is D4, the minimal nilpotent orbit of SO8, and the um, uh, moduli are five. The leaf has dimension 10. Any question for this derivation using the Higgs mechanism? Okay, so, so now I expect that we know how to derive the Hasse diagram each time the Higgs mechanism is, um, um, is uh, doable. Right? If there is a classical theory and I have Lagrangian, then I could just apply the Higgs mechanism and generate the Hasse diagram. There are many cases where symplectic singularities don't have such a description, but if there exists such a description, then I know how to derive it using the Higgs methods. Any question? Okay. So, um, The, once we understand this, we, we could do the uh, part which is probably less familiar, and, and this is using the uh, Coulomb branch. So, uh, so as I said before, I need to start from uh, the top, and I need to, uh, since I'm interested in the Higgs branch of SU3 with six flavors, I need to come up with a, a, a quiver such that its Coulomb branch is uh, that of the Higgs branch of SU3 with six levels. And for this, we have the, the theory of uh, three-dimensional mirror symmetry. Uh, how, how many people know how to derive mirrors for uh, simple uh, theories? Uh, is there any estimate? Do we need to go over methods of computing mirrors, 3D mirrors? Uh, if a quick review is possible, I think it might help people. I see. So I will prepare it for the next time. At the moment, what I will do is to uh, just use the quiver. So this is the quiver. You see, uh, let, let's just count. Let's verify that the dimension is 10. So if I sum those numbers, I have three here, three and three, then two. So the total sum to, to 11. 
remember there is no value uh, one which is uh, acting freely, and therefore the dimension of the field group is 10. So the dimension of the cool branch is 10. We are taking this for granted that this is the um, uh, the uh, 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 the quiver such that its Coulomb branch is the Higgs branch of SC3 with six levels. The next time we will derive it. Uh, but given that this is the quiver, let's now see how to use the method of quiver subtraction. And so the uh, it's a prescription. It's a combinatorial prescription. And the prescription says, given a quiver, look for all possible sub diagrams, which are of the type of those minimal uh, diagrams that we saw before, that we saw uh, in this uh, uh, diagram. And, and actually in the, uh, one of our last papers, we made a list. So there is a table where uh, you have a list of all possible quivers you can subtract. Those are all the uh, minimal uh, 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 singularities that we are aware of. And so those are all guys that are uh, eligible for subtraction. Uh, for the moment, let's just take this list here as the list for uh, subtracting quivers. And if we observe the quiver over here, we find that there is only one uh, diagram that fits inside this quiver, and that's the diagram of uh, affine D4. Uh, now here, uh, uh, in some cases, I saw that people are confused. I'm not, not looking for diagrams which are of finite type. I'm only looking for affine Dinkin diagrams. So the only uh, diagram, which is a sub diagram of this is affine D4. You see four lines in a central loop. You won't be able to fit E6 affine. You won't be able to fit A affine and any other. Is this clear? Sorry, just a heads up, like we'll need to do Q&A in a little bit. So if uh, yes. if you could uh, wrap, so wrap up. Finish this and wrap it up, right? Yeah. Very, it's a good point to, to stop indeed. So I, I, I find that the quiver is, uh, the sub diagram is D4. And so I subtract it. Uh, it has dimension five. So let's do the subtraction. Uh, I subtract one from here, so I'm left with uh, nothing. One from here, I'm left with nothing. Uh, one from here, I'm left with one. This is going to be this one. This one is not subtracted, so it stays. Uh, this three subtracted two, remain one. Here, two minus one is one. And this remains, okay? Now, the next step in the algorithm is to make sure that the balance of the nodes uh, of the initial quiver are kept fixed. Now, uh, affine diagrams are always balanced. So when I subtract, I don't change the balance of the previous, of the node before. Whatever the balance was before, it remains. The only thing which changes balance are those two nodes at the edges. So uh, this has a balance zero because it has two labels minus twice one, that's zero. This also has balance zero. So I need to make sure that after subtraction, this has a balance zero. So I took care of all of those guys. If I add one node of one here, then this will be balanced, this will be balanced. And now everybody is happy. So uh, I added this extra node in order to maintain the balance of those uh, nodes which lost their balance. Okay, so this is the resulting quiver. However, this quiver is nothing but the uh, affine uh, Dinkin diagram for uh, SL6. And, uh, and therefore the uh, Coulomb branch of this guy is the minimal SL6 or A5. Again, dimension five. And uh, now I'm done because I reached a minimal singularity and I'm having, I reproduced the Hasse diagram once using the uh, method of quiver subtraction and once using the Higgs mechanism.
Any questions? Okay, so I, I'm, I'm, it's a good point to stop. Okay. Uh, let, let me let me actually. Uh, I, I think I had an exercise. So exercise. So next time, figure out the Hasse diagram for the Higgs punch of SU4 with nine flavors. And do it in two steps. First, do it going bottom up using the Higgs mechanism. And second, do it uh, top down using the method of Kuiper's attraction. Okay, great. So let's thank the speaker. Thank you. And then uh, let's go ahead and start the formal, formal Q and A session. Yeah, I'll talk a bit too. <laughs> let's start. The, uh, so, if anybody has any questions, please type them into the chat or raise your hand. Okay. Uh, so let's do uh, Aswin. Yeah, so uh, in the last slide, did you also uh, have an argument from the Coulomb branch for why the uh, first step in the Hasse diagram corresponds to a SO8 uh, minimal nilpotent orbit? Yeah, that, that's the global. So you, you see the. the um, where is it? Um, yeah, so let's look here. You see, the remaining theory is SU2 with four flavors. Right, so, but this is using the Higgs branch, right? Like for the Coulomb branch argument, is, is there an independent way to see that there as well? Uh, that the slice is D4? Yeah. That's the only sub diagram which is D4, which is uh, fitting. Ah, okay. Right? No, no other diagram fits. So the, the thing that I subtract, also enters as the slice. I see. I, also here, right? I, I, I'm here at, at the top, I'm at this phase. I subtract it, I'm left with nothing, just the point. And so the slice is minimal A5. And actually, it's a, it's a beautiful combinatorial technique, which allows you to compute many complicated Hasse diagrams. So you, it's, you could very easily teach a computer to find all sub diagrams, and it will generate for you a nice tree of all possible phases. Uh, I, and the existence of this magnetic quiver procedure is also tied to the existence of a Lagrangian or is it sort of independent of that? No, uh, you know, uh, we are back to the uh, initial uh, figure that we had at the beginning, right? That uh, some singularities have uh, hyperkeled quotient construction, some don't, some only have uh, Coulomb branch, some have both. Uh, each time I have a quiver construction, I can use either the uh, Higgs mechanism technique or mm -hmm. the equivalent subtraction technique, or both. Okay. In fact, uh, it's a very interesting exercise to uh, reproduce what we know from the theory of nilpotent orbits, right? Because let's say I propose a quiver for a given orbit closure, then I can use the, uh, the technique of uh, either quiver subtraction or Higgs mechanism to check that I indeed uh, reproduce all of what we know from the Hasse diagrams of important orbits. Okay, uh, so now Matt has a question. Hi, Ami. Thank you for the talk. Hello. Um, on one of your slides, you mentioned the examples where the, the Coulomb branch flavor symmetry can be bigger than you might expect from the balancing. Um, yes. So 
the balancing comes right from like competing the R charges of monopole operators. So I was wondering if you could say uh, what type of operators are responsible for this enhancement where it increases the rank? Yeah, so, so you know, typically you would say that uh, this node here too, do you see the node? Yeah. So uh, typically you'd say, oh, this is not balanced. Therefore uh, I cannot have a, a monopole operator which will have uh, a R card uh, one. But that's where the argument uh, fails. You, you could, uh, but, but now how does it fail? It, you'll have to connect it to all of the other nodes in order to construct a, a a, a monopole operator that has uh, R charge two or spin one, however you call it. And similarly here, those guys which are seemingly unbalanced and in normal quivers would produce um, a monopole operators which have R charge bigger than one. In this case, uh, you will be able to construct a combination that takes into account all of the other nodes so you have a collection of magnetic charges from all other nodes, and, and then you will be able to construct this thing. So I, I would suggest to do it as, a, as an exercise, just to get impressed by the, uh, by the deception that you have from the, the way the quiver looks. Uh, yeah. Is there any hint that there's, um, there's some uh, rule that's some simile or rule or scheme yeah. that that takes this into account more broadly. Yes, yes. So that's the uh, the thing that we were uh, oh, okay. right. working on with, with uh, Kirsty. You may remember her as a student in your class. I do. Ah, you do? Okay, very good. So uh, I think uh, it will be, very, she, she could uh, give you very nice explanations about uh, the way the construction uh, goes and uh, how to, to generate infinitely many examples. It's really Thanks. I look forward to it. Yes, yes. Thank you. Okay, I think that's all of the questions that I see. Um, so let's everyone thank the speaker again. Okay.